Start suck and we'll make better ones. How? Make them out of steel and we'll weld them. Yeah. yeah. To the lab. The time for toys is over. Now we're going to design our own darts and forge them out of steel. We're going to learn about the science, technology, mechanical and aerospace engineering used to make our custom projectiles possible. Then put our darts to the test. Here's our team. This is Beck Conrad. Awesome. She's a controls engineer. She does control systems for animatronic dragons. This is Peter Volkrot. <laughs> He's an electrical engineer. He does furniture building and medical robotics. I'm Jeremy Swordlow. I'm a mechanical engineer. I do machine design and prototypes. The challenge is to build aerodynamically stable and effective projectiles. Our darts will consist of the four components shown. The tip, barrel, and shaft are all one piece of forged steel. The fins will be bent out of wire, welded on, then covered. Beck and Peter are both experienced and skilled fabricators, but it's their first time in a blacksmith shop, and I'm a novice as well. This is going to be fun, but we're going to need a little help to do it right. We need someone to keep us safe and give us advice. This is Jim Austin. This is his shop. They're not gonna die. Not yet. What are you doing? <laughs> are you flossing her? First up, we're gonna cut our round stock to a good length so we have something to grab onto using the cold saw. This tool cuts through steel fast thanks to its sharp, liquid cooled, and lubricated hard tungsten carbide teeth. Now that we cut our stock, let's forge our tip. So how do we know when to take it out of the furnace? Well, so I got this really cool toy. It's a thermal gun. And it's maxed out. Can't go that high. I should have checked that first. Oh, you can fix it with a hammer. All right, we're just gonna do a little straightening. Man, you this guys is, are making me look so bad. This is the fun part. Those tips are so great. I think it was straighter before I started hammering it. It probably was. <laughs> We're all, we're all set with that. All right. Why don't you sit it over here and uh, we'll let it cool down. All right, this is the hot one. Let's take a close look at the material we're working with. When you alloy iron with carbon and other trace elements, you get steel, which is arguably one of the most useful materials mankind has ever produced. Steel has played a role in almost every great invention of ours from the moment of its conception. Everyone knows that steel is everywhere and is a virtual requirement for modern society, but it has other unexpected and specialized uses. Steel provides a productive setting for numerous battle sequences because cinder blocks and drywall just can't handle this kind of action. Because of its superior material properties in the late 20th century, and even to this day, it's one of the most convenient, practical, and effective means of killing most models of Terminators. Ask most anyone why steel is so useful, and they'll say, because it's so strong. But scientists and engineers don't like to say one material is stronger than another because there are many different types of strength. It's kind of like saying which is better, giraffes or kittens? Well, that all depends on just what you're using them for. First up is tensile strength. It's the ability of a material to absorb stress and tension, and it's sort of the bench press of the material science world. It's the number most people look at first, and it's a good indicator, but it doesn't tell you the whole story. There's also compressive strength and shear strength. Bending stress comes from a combination of compression and tensile loads. 
Resistance to twisting or torsion comes from good shear strength. Hardness, abrasion resistance, and impact strength are also derived from these primary material properties. Other materials may beat steel in some of these categories, but for now, steel is still the overall strength champion. I Carbon fiber has superior tensile strength, but can't handle much compression, which is why it tends to shatter when bent or impacted. Concrete is just the opposite. It has enormous compressive strength, but almost no tensile strength, which is why we have to pre-tension it with steel to make our bridges. Glass is harder and stiffer than steel. We can even scratch the steel hammer with it, but it has very little impact strength, which is one of the major reasons you don't often see glass machines. Wood may be good, but steel is real and infinitely recyclable. Well, now that we have our material, let's take a closer look at our dart design. Humans have been building and optimizing projectiles for thousands of years. The real key to their effectiveness is aerodynamic stability. But what does that mean exactly? We're going to define stability as our dart's ability to fly parallel with the airstream flowing across it, as shown by these blue arrows. The angle that any flying body makes with the medium it's traveling through is known as the angle of attack, and we want this to be as close to zero as possible. If we can achieve that, the tip will always be pointing straight ahead and tangent along its parabolic ballistic trajectory. The last thing we want is our darts to get a mine of their own. Go! Which way to go? Well, I don't know, but he went that away. Let's go! Dumb Aircraft can change their angle of attack by actively moving plates called control surfaces to deflect air moving across their wings. You probably noticed this on your last flight. Our darts are not going to have such a sophisticated added to control system. Our fins are fixed, but whether they move or not, the concept is the same. To design our darts to be inherently stable, it's critical to understand and control two major things, the center of gravity and the center of pressure. We need to find the CG because if our dart is going to tumble, this is the point it's going to tumble around. Think of our dart as kind of a three-dimensional weather vane, and the CG is its pivot point. The center of gravity is also the dart's balance point, and that should be no surprise because it's determined by mass. Here's a simple case. It's just a plain rod, so obviously the CG is going to be in the center. The computer uses this pink triad to mark CG, but we're going to use our own symbol. Here's the pivot point on the computer, and here it is in real life. If we don't like the spot where our rod tumbles, we can easily change the CG by changing the mass distribution by putting a large mass in the direction we want the CG to move. Step two is determining our center of pressure. Figuring this out is a bit more complicated, but it's going to answer the question why our dart looks the way it does. Here's a computer simulation of the air flowing around our dart, flying at an angle other than level. The streaming color bands represent airflow, and the color pressure map on the dart's surface represent a combination of lift and drag forces from that air. In the same way that the center of gravity was the center point of our dart's mass, the center of pressure is the center point of all the forces coming from airflow. Let's use this symbol to represent the center of pressure. Now let's say, hypothetically, the CP was in back of the center of gravity, and we add an arrow to represent force and direction. Scientists and engineers call this a force vector. Check out what happens when we change our angle of attack. Forces from airflow will tend to stabilize our dart, but what happens when it's closer to the tip and ahead of the center of gravity? In this scenario, the airflow will make our dart tumble over backwards. This is why the center of pressure must be behind the center of gravity, so no matter what angle the dart flies in, forces from airflow will keep our tip pointing forward. To move the center of pressure to where we want it, we need to minimize destabilizing forces by making the tip small, while at the same time maximizing stabilizing forces in our tail by making its surfaces big. Our design comes from following these aerodynamic rules, just like all other projectiles. That's why our dart looks the way it does, and not some other shape, like the common, everyday, household refrigerator. Refrigerators can fly, but they don't fly well. They're extremely unstable. Unfortunately, none of the members of the team are strong enough to properly throw a full-size refrigerator. So to test things out, we're going to have to settle for the next best thing and enlist the help of an atomic bomb. Let's run a simulation of what's going on here. 
As we can see, the refrigerator is pretty much symmetrical, so its CG is roughly in the center, but check out this pressure map. Almost all the pressure on this projectile is at the front face. This is bad news for the aerodynamic stability of our home appliance because it indicates very high forces trying to flip it over backwards. We can now see why our unlucky refrigerator tumbled uncontrollably. With the center of pressure so far forward from the center of gravity, once its aerodynamic instability started it tumbling, it just kept on spinning. In the business, we call this conflicting data. Our simulations may look pretty cool, but they don't give us the actual location of the center of pressure. We need to figure this out before we go any further. Did I put the center of pressure in back? <laughs> Every time you say center of pressure, everyone take a drink. But how do you know where the center of pressure is? I'm glad you asked that question. Yeah, how do we figure it out? For any airfoil or a thin airfoil section, a really, really rule of thumb is the quarter cord okay. is where the center of pressure on that airfoil acts. It, it turns out that our cameraman is actually an aerospace engineer. So this is actually not too not too far off. I think, see, I think it was a little see, bit see, it's See, it's going to work. All you have to say is that it's, right. it's going to work. It's going to work, but I just wanted to educate you. Okay, okay. Me, yeah. Oh, I'm, I, yeah, I, I, stand, I, I stand educated. Yeah. I stand before you an educated man. Let's use a simplified version of the same type of calculations NASA used to determine the stability of their rockets in the early 60s. These calculations break up the problem into segments shown here. Red vectors are trying to flip us backwards, and green ones are trying to stabilize us. Now let's add them all together so we only get one vector, and it looks like we're good to go. This may seem all scientific, but we're not doing science here, we're doing engineering. We're not trying to answer a question by forming an hypothesis and performing experiments. We don't have to. We're standing on the shoulders of the brilliant scientists who've come before us. Scientists discover and explain the underlying fundamental principles of the universe and make the engineering we're doing today possible. Forge some steel, man. Forge steel. Our next build steps involve first trimming down our round stock, then forging our shaft. I'm sure our forgings are all cool by now, so let's bring them over to this template and mark things out. This is the cut line for our rod stock, and this is where we should start forging our shaft with the air hammer once we've heated it in the furnace. You can't see pencil lines on glowing metal, so we use this center punch to make really big marks before trimming down our rods. Well, now that we've made our, uh, our dart bodies here, we have to prep the surface for welding so we can get our fins on. So let's go to the sandblaster. All of the oxygen in the atmosphere has reacted with the, the surface of the steel. This oxide layer doesn't like to be welded very much. And so we're gonna blast this with coincidentally aluminum oxide in the sandblaster. I want a sandblaster, I've never done it before. Oh, you totally can. Black switch. Where's the button? Okay, right. Right down there. See that yellow thing? Step oh. on that. You said that there was a lever on the hose. The hose is the one that wasn't the right one. Why would I ask you about the <laughs> one that wasn't the right one? <laughs> I want to know all the information about the one I'm not supposed to <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> 
<laughs> it was working now. Sam blasting. That's much better. Next up is fabricating our fin frames out of this copper coated steel welding wire, then welding them onto our shafts. Beck and I are the welders in the group, but we both specialize on different equipment. Beck is the MIG expert. Right, Beck? Right. Well, I'll be welding on the TIG machine. Weld off! Weld off! I'm gonna use hot glue. MIG stands for metal inert gas. The metal part of the acronym refers to the metal welding wire that feeds out of the gun when the trigger is pulled. The inert gas is argon on both MIG and TIG welding, and its job is to shield the weld from oxygen in the atmosphere to stop it from reacting with the hot metal and contaminating the weld. When she pulls the trigger, argon flows from the nozzle along with the electrically charged wire. When this filler wire makes contact with the workpiece, an electric arc melts it into liquid metal which flows in between the parts, heating them up and fusing them together. MIG welders excel in thick metals, but it's difficult for them to weld such small pieces. So the fact that Beck can do this so well is a real testament to her skill. Awesome. TIG is a little bit different. The business end of a TIG welder is called a torch, and it's used in a similar way gas torches are. The big difference is the TIG torch heats the workpiece with a precise and highly controllable electric arc instead of flammable gases. Controlling this arc is done with a foot pedal, which simultaneously turns on the power and starts the flow of masking gas. I can spray electrons out of this. Okay. The T in TIG stands for tungsten. It's the electrode tip where the electric arc is developed. We use tungsten because it is the highest melting point of any known metal, so it's not vaporized from the intense heat of the arc. Normally, TIG welders use hand-fed filler rod to increase weld strength by filling the gaps between parts. But since we're using filler rod to actually make our fins, we don't need it. Oh no, man, here's another practice. We can just go right to it. Okay, Pivo. Yeah. So this is TIG welding. He doesn't need a test piece. <laughs> go for it. There you go. Bam. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. With our welding complete, now it's time for tip sharpening. Just, just, just the tip, man. It, it's no, a, I don't want just the tip. It'll take too long. I don't want just the tip. I want more than the tip. <laughs> you I want, want the whole? I want the whole thing. You want the whole thing. I want this whole thing to be sharpened. Just not, the tip. Not the teeny tiny tip. I want Does the it, big tip. You want the big tip? Yeah. That that, that looks awesome. Our last step is applying our decal printed lightweight organic fiber reinforced composite pressure sensitive adhesive coated low density polyethylene omnidirectional fixation strips to provide aerodynamic stability. There's skulls all over yours. That scares me. Kinda kinda seems inadequate, doesn't it? Alright, so you, you guys wanna you guys wanna throw these? You wanna throw them at stuff? Yeah, yeah. Well it just so happens I have a spot in mind.